yourselves as you learn more about this church community from Pastor Jonathan. Please see the comment section or visit our website to sign up. Also, at this time, if you have any prayer requests to offer, please share them in the comment section on Facebook. For our Advent study this year, our very own Alice Montgomery will be leading us through Amy Jill Levine's Advent study titled Light of the World. The study explores the biblical text surrounding the story of the birth of Jesus and what we can learn from the various cultural, theological, and spiritual aspects of these stories. The study includes a book and videos we'll watch during each session. The class will occur on Sunday mornings, 9.30 a.m. to 10.30 a.m. on Zoom from November 29th through December 20th. To sign up, simply email adam at agwhite at Dallas. Org. We are having a church gathering via Zoom each Wednesday evening from 6.30 to 7.30. This is simply a time to spend together and catch up. Come and go as you please. Please see our website for the link. Uh, this week on Wednesday is Veterans Day, and so I just want to say a quick word of thanks to the veterans in our community. The memorial candle is lit today in honor of Paul McWilliams, who passed away on Wednesday. Paul, the brother of Grace, is Robert McWilliams, so please keep the McWilliams family in your prayers. And now, let us turn our hearts and minds to worship. is coming in uh, Please join me in the call to worship. Are you awake? Are you alert? Christ is coming into our lives in a new way. Are you watching the signs? Are you interpreting what is happening today? Christ is coming into our lives in a new way. Do you see opportunities for ministry? Do you see the poor 
the homeless, the hungry, the needy. Christ is coming into our lives in a new way. Come, let us worship, and let us work in the reign of God. Christ has extended the invitation. Let us work together in the reign of God on earth. Before I ask you to join me in this morning's hymn, Lift Every Voice and Sing, as we come toward the close of another bitterly contested political season, I'd like to take a minute to say, and I say I because these are my words and thoughts, that I sing this song with you this morning in meditation on, appreciation of, and as a tribute to the myriad American voices who sang it in their homes and in their churches and in the streets as they worked and prayed and marched for the right of every single one of us to have our voices heard by our government. Specifically, I sing today in honor of the women of color who have borne the weight of this nation on their backs for 400 years and somehow still managed to rise up and carry us forward. This time, to an election in which more people of all backgrounds, ethnicities, ideologies, and faiths came out to vote than ever before. This is their song. Please lift your voices with me wherever you are. The lyrics are printed in the order of worship on the Grace live stream page of our website. May we bring it to God humbly in gratitude for their work and the power of every voice.
At this time, we'd like to confess the peace of Christ, and as we do so, I'm wondering, what is uniting us? What have you witnessed as God's movement to unite? That could be in the last day, could be in the last week, maybe it was this morning, but what is something that you have felt God uniting you towards? Let us now share peace. morning again. Uh, Jonathan and Bonnie asked me to be one of our stewardship month speakers. I'm glad to do it. Grace Church means a lot to me. You know, the theme of exile, of being away from home, is big in the Old Testament. I don't know about you, but I feel as if, I, as if I've been in exile from grace to my spiritual home in this pandemic period. Jonathan, Adam, Michael, and others have done a great job in gathering us online and will emerge from this pandemic with a technological skill set that will serve us over the long haul. But I miss us being together in person. I miss the handshakes and hugs. I miss singing together. I miss standing in the communion line. I miss the potlucks. I've never really wanted to be part of a church foot washing but I would be willing to give it a try once we're back together. That's how much I miss being with everybody. In a time of exile, stewardship is even more important. I like to think of stewardship as keeping the faith, keeping faith with one another, with our call to spread and live the gospel. This year, our stewardship or faith-keeping campaign has a slogan, Time, Talent, and Treasure. I hope we'll use this exile time to look after one another. If you're aware you can do more in the way of checking on other church members, please do. Try to step up the pace of making calls, sending emails and texts, writing notes, making drive-by visits where that's safe to do so. Let's confound this pandemic by drawing even closer together as a church. That's one way we keep the faith. I hope we'll also use this time to take an inventory of our own talents and the talents we see elsewhere in the congregation and get ready to emerge from the pandemic with innovative, effective, new, and renewed ministries. Stewardship, faith-keeping, is as much about mission as it is about anything else. As for treasure, well, there's never enough of that. Grace has come through the pandemic pretty well financially, thanks to the PPP program, steady giving, and saving on expenses. But we need to finish this year strong so we can position ourselves to be the church we need to be, want to be, emerging from COVID-19. So if you can boost your regular giving or make a special contribution before the end of the year, please do. It will be fully accounted for, wisely used, much appreciated. To those three key words, time, talent, and treasure, I would add one more, tenacity. Grace has come through hard times before. 
One of our former pastors, the late Bill Bryan, used to speak often of the durable saints who kept the church going when some thought it would have to close. We've lost some durable saints of Grace Church in recent years, even in recent weeks. So it's our time to be the durable saints, to be tenacious about using our time, talent, and treasure in helping Grace shine Christian light all over East Dallas and beyond. And I get a virtual amen for that. Amen. Jonathan knows I work cheap, so he also asked me to read the scripture this morning. And I'm glad to do that. I will be reading from a, a very strong passage, Amos 5, 18 through 24, the New Revised Standard Version. Alas for you who desire the day of the Lord. Why do you want the day of the Lord? It is darkness, not light, as if someone fled from a lion and was met by a bear, or went into the house and rested a hand against the wall and was bitten by a snake. Is not the day of the Lord darkness, not light, and gloom with no brightness in it? I hate, I despise your festivals, and I take no delight in your solemn assembly. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. And the offerings of well-being of your fatted animals, I will not look upon. Take away from me the noise of your song. I will not listen to the melody of your heart. But let justice roll down like water and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Thank you, Sam. Thank you to everyone here today. And it's such a joy that so many people wanted to share their musical gifts with the church, so we actually had to record the choir early in order to keep with the amount of people we could have in the service safely. And so thank you to all the musicians who have sang, to Cassie who's still here, to all those who had to leave already. What a joy it is to be a part of this church and to serve this church in its faithfulness. Let us pray. Fill us with your spirit, Lord. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be open and acceptable unto you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, good morning, church. It is a joy to be with you on this Sunday morning, a day in which we come together to praise God, to sing our praises, to pray, to get to know God more and to get to know each other more. I have a question for you today, and if you want to answer it in our Facebook live stream, go right ahead. How are you feeling today? Grace Church, how are you feeling today? Now, we are a traditional church with progressive values. So most of us, not all of us, most of us are probably celebrating today because the presidential election, which was finally called yesterday morning around this time, broke in a way that a lot of us were hoping for. Not every one of us. So I'm assuming that most of us are pretty happy and relieved this morning or feeling some sense. So share one word or one phrase. How are you feeling this morning? To those of us who are celebrating and thrilled, don't let anyone take your joy away. Find relief and find happiness today. To those of you who are not celebrating, who are worried about the future of our nation, I am here to listen to your fears and to assure you of the presence and power and the love of Christ. Earlier, Adam asked, what unites us today? A vital question, especially for a church in these divisive times. I've got family members who tend to vote differently than I do. And I spoke to them yesterday. <laughs> to, uh, well, let me just say this, not to rub it in or anything like that, but I spoke to them because I said, I want to listen to your fears. And what united us was being able to speak to each other and love each other 
not have all the answers, because if you think of me as your pastor, if you think I have all the answers, I don't. But I am able to be a presence in your life that will listen and love you. And how vital it is that we have this church that Sam talked about, in which we give our times, our talents, our treasure, and our tenacity so that we all have a place where we know we are loved and listened to and respected. So church, how are you feeling today? And another question for you, why are you here this morning? What brings you to Grace Church? Why are you watching through the live stream? Why did you show up? Was it because Michael asked you to sing? Was it because it's just our ritual? Why are you here? It's a historic day in our nation's history. Last night, like many of you, I watched as Vice President-elect Kamala Harris walked out on stage in suffragette white and spoke to a nation. And let's be honest, I can say, I'm going to say this, and this might be controversial. I'm not endorsing Republicans or Democrats or any political party, but for the last four years, we've had a leader in this nation who has been cruel and who has lied. That's just a fact. It has gaslit us. And we've been in an abusive relationship with our leader. We have a leader who has empowered and emboldened white supremacists and racial divide. And now, like many of you, I watched speeches last night and heard words of healing and hope. And instead of narcissism, I watched Kamala Harris come out and talk about how you did this, you voted, you organized. And Joe Biden, President-elect Biden, come out and say that he will govern for all of us. And that he seeks truth and healing for our nation. I hope you are here today because you seek that same truth and that same healing because those things are God's things. There's a lot of answers to the question of why are we here because it's just routine, perhaps. I can say that I'm here because I get paid to be here. I can say that I'm here because I enjoy the spotlight and I enjoy public speaking. I, that would be a terrible answer to give because it makes it about my ego and not about God. As many of you know, my previous appointment in the United Methodist Church was to a nonprofit called City Square where I worked with folks who were homeless or formerly homeless. I started a church called Church at the Square. And while I was pastor of Church at the Square... I was also the property manager of a development called The Cottages. Fifty homes were the hardest to house homeless folks in Dallas. And so some of the folks who lived at The Cottages would come to Church at the Square. And a friend of mine did one Sunday, and we had worship, and I talked about grace. Grace is vital to us, not because it's the name of the church or because it's my last name. We need to understand grace because it's vital to our understanding of our faith as Methodists. Grace is the transformational work that God is doing in your life and in the world. And so I spoke about transformation and change. And we sat down to lunch after the service. And my friend said to me, I I didn't think your sermon was accurate. I thought it was wrong. Always a weird thing when someone says, I think your sermon was wrong. Well, what was wrong about it? And he had this to say, nothing ever really changes. People don't change. The world does not change. Our circumstances don't change. And I asked him that question. Well, why are you here? Why are you at church if nothing changes? I recognize it's a strange text to read today, to have Sam read today, because for many of us, and I'm seeing this in the comment sections, I feel like I can breathe again. I'm feeling peace. I'm feeling joy. Uh, someone writes, I feel emotionally drained. Well, I hope today you are filled with uh, emotions of joy and kindness and love, joy is the possibilities. So why do we have a text today? It talks about, alas, for the day of the Lord, it is darkness, not light. Like you were running from a lion and were met by a bear. I love that metaphor. That's a strange one. I despise, I hate, I despise your festivals. I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, 
I will not accept them. Take away from me the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the melody of your harps. Does God say that that God doesn't want Cassie to sing or the choir to sing or Michael to play? Is God rejecting the idea of worship? It seems to be that's the case with a superficial reading of the text. And I know it is wounding to some of us to hear that phrase that God hates and God despises. Many of you have grown up with that. And because we're a reconciling church, I know that many of us in this congregation grew up in churches or homes that said God hates you, God despises you because of your sexual orientation, because of those you love. And so it is sometimes wounding to read texts like this. And so to understand it, we need to dive into it. And understand that there is a purpose to worship. You see, we've talked in recent weeks about how God led the Israelites out of slavery in Egypt and through the Red Sea into Mount Sinai. And God established a covenant with the people that was life-giving and abundant as opposed to the toxic and harmful structure of slavery. And so God, in the time of the prophet Amos, had set up festivals and worship services in which all people would gather and worship God. And in these festivals, and in the music, and the prayer, and in the meals together, people were to be reminded of the goodness of God, of the abundance of God, and how God is the God of all people who shares. And when everyone, people would gather, the rich and the poor would sit together in community. And the rich were called upon to be like God, who is generous, and be generous with what they had with the poor. God established this so that we might know the character of God and be reminded that because we are God's creation, we are to be like God and be generous and loving and communal. But what happens with human nature sometimes, in fact, often, When we have much, we grow fearful that we will lose it. So instead of being generous and sharing, people began to hoard, and a a festival and a gathering that was created for inclusion became exclusionary. And a place that was meant to be a place of community became a place of isolation, and a place that was meant to be a place of generosity, sacrifice, and abundance became a place of tight-fistedness hoarding. That is what God despises when we gather to worship without a heart for worship. When we go through the routines but don't recognize the goodness and abundance of God that is in the midst, the grace of God that is transforming our lives. Worship, Bible study, prayer, all the classes we take, this Advent study coming up, this Wednesday night gathering, all the things that we do as Grace Church are designed to connect us deeply with the heart of God so that we know who God is, and in knowing who God is, we know who we are. It's meant to show us the truth that God is at work making not only our lives better, but the world better. And it doesn't always look that way. Sometimes I know the world gets worse. And when it does, that is not the will of God. But I hope we see that so often, because we are the church, and because we know God and love God, that we see God's grace in our lives. I will tell you that when my friend said, nothing changes, people don't change, our lives don't change, our world doesn't change, I was deeply offended. Because here's a man who was homeless, living on the streets with literally nothing. And for ten years, people plotted and planned and had ideas and had to sell this controversial idea and had to raise millions of dollars and had to partner with all kinds of different organizations, including Highland Park at a Methodist church in the city of Dallas and the county of Dallas. And all these people had to come together to build these 50 homes so that God's beloved children who had to sleep on the streets had a place of their own. Have their own bedroom, 
their own bathroom, their own kitchen, with a food pantry across the street, with people on site to love them, with a minister that God put there to love them and guide them and to walk with them and journey with them. And he didn't see it. His cynicism and the brokenness of what he had experienced kept him from seeing the goodness of God in his life. How often do we miss out on the goodness of God that is right in front of us? How often because of our routines or our cynicism or our woundedness do we fail to acknowledge the good things that God is doing for us and through us and for our society. My friends, grace, church, and our worship is a good thing that God is doing to guide us deeper into our love of God and deeper into our love of each other. I know the heart of this church. And I believe that instead of saying, I despise your festivals and your songs, as God says, I find great joy in grace. Joy at the heart of this congregation that cares so deeply for their neighbor. Just yesterday, we had a small gathering, a graveside service for Riley Miller. Riley was one of the durable saints that uh, Bill Bryan spoke about so long ago and that Sam just reminded us of. And in that service, Siegel spoke about how he cared for his neighbor. Spoke about how he would go to people's homes and make phone calls and how he would be active in the lives of people to make sure that they knew they were loved and that they had someone to connect with. We read in our text about a day that God envisions, a day when justice flows down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. My friends, righteousness is how we interact as an individual, how we care for each other. Justice is how we care for each other based on our systems, through the church, through our government, and God demands that we actively be in both. We need to be righteous and just. Riley was a righteous man who cared deeply for those around him. Riley and Janie are just people who cared deeply for this church, supported this church, so that this church may be a place where everyone experiences the love of God. And don't worry if you're upset about not being able to make that small grace by service. Janie has assured me that when we are finally able to gather again, whether it's six months, a year, two years from now, whenever it is, We're going to have a service for Riley to celebrate his life, to mourn his death, and to give thanks for his resurrection. Whenever we're able to see each other and give each other those great big Riley hugs that I know all of us are missing. My friends, my church family, everything we do should point us to deeper connection with God so that we may go forth into a world that is hurting and divided and proclaim unity and hope, unity and love, unity and the good news. Now we saw a hint of that last night with the president-elect and the vice president-elect, but I hope you are not under the impression that our job as a church is done, that God's vision of justice and righteousness has been fulfilled because of an election. That is not the case. There are still children who are hungry, and so we still need to continue our programs like Food for Thought. There are still people who don't have the medical care they need, so we still need to continue to support organizations like the Agape Clinic. There are still people who need to find value in their talents and in the gifts and graces that God has given them, so we need to continue to support things like the Ubuntu Music Project. We need to look at the future of this church and see where is God leading us into righteousness and justice. What's the next chapter, not only for our nation, but for Grace Church? It's a wonderful and extraordinary time. Because I know that God is leading us to a place where justice rolls down like waters. Righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Amen.
believe it is time for the uh, electronic offering. Is that correct? I have left my program in my pew. Okay. Excellent. My friends, as we prepare to give our tithes, our gifts, and our offerings, I'm reminded that uh, the work of this church is only made possible because we are sacrificial in our giving. And I'm reminded of the goodness of how Riley supported us and loved us. And so we have set up a Riley Memorial Fund to go towards our stewardship campaign. So I ask now that you consider giving your gift and your tithe to Grace Church so we may continue to do the good work of reaching out, loving all, and growing in grace.
one of the classic definitions of a sacrament is something that is an outward, visible sign of an inward, invisible grace. Traditional sacraments are ordinate or ordainment, baptism, marriage, the anointing of the sick, confession, and communion, and vary from one denomination to another. They arise from the passage affirming an inner working of God. Christine continues to walk us towards reconnectivity with the earth, this time looking at the aspects of nature that express outwardly the deep inner workings of the Christ mystery. Earth and its nature blesses us with God's visual representation of a transformative life. It's a poem, really. A love letter full of metaphor, revealing God's presence everywhere, in everything, and in everyone. God is intimately involved, continually expressing love at every turn. Listen, listen with as many senses as you can. Receive as much divine light and love as you can. having some technical difficulties, so please bear with us in patience and in grace. I want to remind you again at this time to send in any prayer requests you have, any joys, any concerns, because as soon as the video is over, we will shift into our, our prayers of the people followed by the Lord's Prayer. Thank you, Church. Let me know when we're are we back live. Okay. Folks, we have had some technical difficulties, so we're not being able to show that video this week, so we're going to go right to the... Well, we'll show it later. Uh, but right now we're going to have our prayers of the people. So I'm going to go through and make sure that if you sent in a prayer request that it is spoken today. Let us bow our heads. Gracious God, we are so thankful that you are with us, present in our worship today, that you have given us this time to love you more and to love each other more, that you have given us the good gift of grace to United Methodist Church, that you have brought your people together on this historic day in the history of our nation, and that you, even as you are with us in the experiences of our lives, that you draw us to a broader picture of your righteousness and your justice. And so, Lord, today we take the time not only to give you thanks, but to pray with each other. I ask this congregation to join me in prayer as I will read prayer requests. And when I am done, I will say, Lord, in your mercy, and together we will say, hear our prayers. And so, Lord, we pray this morning for Emma Smith, Barbara's daughter, who was involved in a car wreck recently and has a pinched nerve in her back that she will continue to heal. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we pray for our nation and for unity. Not a false unity, but a unity grounded in your love and in the love for each other that you have given us. We may see all people as your children. We may celebrate your goodness and your hope and your healing together. 
Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we are going to pray for a number of people I'm going to list now. We are so, so thankful that Pam Rogers has been so faithful about caring for and listening to the needs of her family and her neighbors. So, Lord, at Pam's direction, we pray for Glenna. Pray for Mike and Roy and Fred and Dennis and Keith. Brayden, Scarlett, Linda, Michaela, and Margie. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we thank that you are involved in the lives of all those many people listed just now. You know what is going on in their lives, even if we do not, and you care deeply for all your children. Lord, we give you thanks uh, for Jennifer's surgery that happened last week. We continue to pray for her recovery. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we give you thanks for Veterans Day. On Wednesday, we ask that you, for all veterans past and present, Lord, that you continue to guide us to love them and honor them. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, today we pray for Alex Tebeck, who, Trebek, who passed away today. Lord, in your mercy. And Lord, we pray for Kevin. Lord, in your mercy. For all these folks listed, for the prayer requests of our hearts, spoken aloud and unspoken, we lift them up to you, knowing that you receive them in your deep love for us. And now, Lord, we join together in the words that you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Well, as we come to the time of celebrating our birthday, um, we recognize those who are on our birthday list. So this week, we have Urza Marigi, we have Benjamin Pennell, Ryan Holloman, and Griffin Roberts. So let's offer a prayer to these awesome people. God of grace, and of mercy, and of endless compassion, we give you thanks for life, life that in so many ways we take for granted, but in days where we can recognize the sacred worth embodied in others, we see that with Ezra, with Benjamin, with Ryan, and with Griffin. Bless their lives this next year. May they find strength and be challenged and encouraged to love as we have seen them love and to fill us as we hope to fill them. Amen. Also, one anniversary is Wendy and Paul. Uh, they have an anniversary, Andy Smith and Paul, uh, Wolfer, Von Wolferfield, sorry. Uh, let's offer them a blessing on their marriage. God, for the gift of love, love that is deep, that is broad, that is open, that is so expansive. We give you thanks. We give you thanks for that love and how it, it is exhibited in Andy and Paul for the love that they in turn show us that reflects not only your love, but indeed love for every living thing. May this next year of marriage be one of growth and of continual um, coming together in their partnership, in their marriage, and in their love for one another in the world. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Before I give the benediction, I say a couple. Before I give the benediction, I want to say a couple of things. I got the notice that yes, that was Alex Trebek who passed away today, the longtime host of Jeopardy. So uh, 
Whenever a public figure passes away, I know a lot of us are in mourning, so we'll continue to pray for his family and for those fans of that show. Um, it's terrible to hear that, but so thankful we have a God of resurrection who loves us and receives us into paradise. Uh, one of the problems with not typing out the sermon and just reading it is I sometimes forget things that are vital. I spoke early in the sermon about the fact that many of you grew up listening to words of hate directed you, God hates you for this, God hates you for that. And I wanted to just reiterate that is not the case. We hear these words in our scripture today, I despise this, I hate that. That's God talking about some actions that we sometimes take. Like a parent disappointed in a child who does something that puts them in harm's way. God loves you. God loves us. And if God is disappointed in us sometimes and hates some of the things we do, it's because those things can bring harm to us. God loves us dearly and never wants us to harm one another. I don't believe I mentioned this sermon. We've been planning to open up for worship on November 29th, the first Sunday of Advent, to have in-person, socially distanced, masked, so forth, worship. At this point, with the rising case numbers of the coronavirus in the city of Dallas, it looks like that will not happen. We're not going to worship in a way that harms us or invites the vulnerable, high-risk folks in our church to put themselves in a position to be harmed. That's not what God wants of us. And so, right now, it looks like we will not be opening on November 29th. I do not know when we will open, but we will do so in time when we can do so safely. That is what God loves caring for each other, looking out for each other, because God loves every single one of us. The benediction today is going to be a little bit different. I received a late night request last night that we perhaps consider changing the hymn to On Eagle's Wings. You can see that Joe Biden quoted that in his speech, a, a Catholic hymn that we Methodists love. So instead of that, I'm going to lead us in singing uh, Eagle's Wings as our benediction. They want to throw that curveball at you to change the hymn at last minute, but let's join together. You can find it on page 143 of your hymnal if you still happen to have a hymnal next to you. But here are the words. I'm going to go through the words twice, then ask Michael to play through the melody once, and we will join together on the second run through of the melody. was left on last week, one of the hymns you got to hear me sing last week. Go forth, friends. Justice and righteousness is your goal, that all may meet in you, the God who loves you and who loves us all. Go in peace.